All right, so now we're recording. And I'm going to go ahead and record this, and I will have the recording sent out to Gay. So if anybody, you know, if you're concerned about the um, content and stuff, don't worry about it. Don't be writing frantic notes. I'll make sure you get a copy of the, um, the presentation as well. So um, just to begin with, let me give you a little bit of an idea about what I'll be going through. And, I, and like I said, I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I think it's more important to make sure that you have a chance to talk and ask some questions. Talk a little bit about, I'm going to talk a little bit about how this whole thing developed very briefly. Um, some, the way that past policies have changed, in case you have a little bit of knowledge about those. Some people know, uh, it's kind of hard for me to gauge what people know and don't know, so I'm just going to give it a quick overview. Um, some of the procedures that the colleges are being asked to carry out to give you an idea about what their process looks like. The PLA crosswalk matrix, which is important for you to know about as far as um, how you can kind of shortcut the process of finding out whether your students have the opportunity to earn some credit before they come in. I'm going to show you the new dashboard tool that we've developed. It's still in the soft launch phase, and I still haven't gotten in and fixed the typos. So if the first thing you do is go in there and find a bunch of typos, don't tell me because I'm still working on them. Ha <laughs> ha. Anyway, I want to show that to you. Um, I want to talk just real briefly about what, what I see as being a good connection between PLA credit and adult ed. Some of the things that we're working through in terms of implementation and then some next steps, some ideas for all of you. So the process started with the CHAMP grant, Colorado Helps Advanced Manufacturing Programs is the grant. It's a, um, a TAA CCCT, and I'm not even going to tell you what that whole acronym means, but it's a Department of Labor grant that um, is specifically focused on getting people through school quickly and into jobs. And so a lot of what we do in those grants, this is the third one that we've had in the state, is to work on acceleration types of activities. And so this time around on round three, we started with this idea of accelerating through credit for prior learning, which was one of the priorities that they put into the grant. So what we said we would do, very simple, redesign the current Colorado Community College system model for credit for prior learning to accelerate certification. And that's it. That's all we we said we would do, and we don't even have any deliverables attached to this, but we've actually done quite a lot more than that. So first we put together a credit for prior learning committee. We had a lot of representation, not a lot of faculty representation, but a lot of the people who were doing the job on the ground, typically registrars, advisors. Um, we did have some faculty. We had some experts that came in and helped us in terms of writing policy. And then in February of last year, we went ahead and submitted a policy to the State Board of Community Colleges and Occupational Education, and they accepted um, that the policy changes, and so we went ahead and updated. Um, <clears throat> we also then, within that, started the, the bones of creating a systems procedures document, which has to go along with every policy, and that still is, it actually just got finished. It took us a while to get that all pulled together. It's kind of hard when you're um, trying to figure out about rules for 13 institutions. And then we're also working on a credit crosswalk matrix, and what that's about is creating um, crosswalks that can be automatic instead of having people have to continuously evaluate. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So we did a couple of things that were just kind of um, simple changes right off the bat. So we changed the name of the policy from credit for prior learning to prior learning assessment credit. And we did that on purpose because we're trying to make a shift in culture from this idea that, and it's a, it's a misperception that a person can kind of buy credit. Well, you know, you could probably buy some credits for what you already know, and we really wanted to step outside of that because the good practice in all of this is that prior learning is about assessment. It's about assessment of prior learning. So to say that I should get college credit for this because I already know it, as opposed to, well, I have this experience and maybe you should give me something for that. So it's a different type of a thinking and it's a shift in, in perception and in, in the way that we go about this. Um, it used to require, the colleges used to require one credit in residency, so students had to register for, for school and they had to register for at least one credit, and typically they'd do more than one before we would look at any of their prior learning opportunities. So if they had, you know, if they had a, a license, um, you know, in a, in a field and we thought, they thought it might be worth some credit to them in college, they would have to register and complete and um, successfully complete at least one credit before we would allow that to happen, and now that's no longer true. The rule in the, in the, um, the policy says that they don't have to transcript any credit before they can start to earn PLA credit, which was a big shift. We see PLA credit as a great incentive for people to come to school who might not otherwise, and it's also a great um, way to build self-efficacy for students to say, well, not only, uh, you know, if they don't see themselves as college material or as a college student, but to be able to say not only could you be a college student, but you already are. You already have credits. 
And um, you'd be amazed at what that does for a person's esteem when they start thinking about that, because college is kind of scary to people who haven't seen themselves before in that, in that role. We changed, uh, we're shifting the cost, um, and that hasn't been put in place yet either. We're still working that through the leadership. But instead of having every college have a different matrix for how um, people pay for assessment, we've shifted that. The one rule that still applies is that we can, um, no one can charge more than 50% of the cost of what the credit, um, the equal number of credits would be. So if a one credit course costs $200, which isn't correct, but just to tell you. So we could not charge more than $100 for the assessment. And that was to make sure that we kept the cost down. But the matrix um, that we're putting together will allow colleges to try to recoup some of their, the costs of doing the assessments while at the same time keeping the cost low to students. No matter what, PLA credit will always cost at least uh, 50, no more than 50% of the cost of regular credit. And then um, assessment practices used to vary a lot by, by colleges, different colleges. Some colleges didn't do some of the methods of PLA at all. Some of them did all of them. Um, you know, depending on how they um, viewed it, it was either a broad outreach to students or there was no outreach at all, lots of different practices. So what we created is a manual of guidelines based on national best practices, and then we're also pushing training for our assessors, which we're doing actually the end of this month and next month. And that training is really um, mostly for assessing portfolios from students, um, because that has been a process that has really been kind of hit or miss that a person could, um, a faculty member, any faculty member could assess, but there weren't really any standards attached to that. And I take nothing away from their um, ability to assess, just to say that we don't really have a lot to support that, and especially when it comes to things like making sure that we're <clears throat> ensuring equity for all students. We didn't really have a lot to back us up, so we felt that that needed to be tightened up. And then the last part of it is we've created, um, there was a handbook specific to the PATH policy. Um, most of the information on it was um, from 2008 or earlier. We felt it was time to update it. We changed the name of it from handbook to manual just to be, just to be um, to make a distinction really more than anything else because we wanted people to stop thinking about the handbook. We weren't just going to update the handbook, we were changing it to the manual. And then to also ex um, to expand the crosswalks, we'll talk about those in a second. So in terms of the procedures, um, colleges are required now to have their prior learning assessment um, be much more forward facing. And again, keep in mind that a lot of this is just hitting the field at the beginning of this semester. So you're not necessarily seeing it at your colleges yet. You're getting this information in a lot of ways around the same time they are. So if you're looking for it, look for it more in the fall than now, because there's a lot going on in terms of implementation. But some colleges, like I would direct you to, um, I would direct you to um, Arapahoe Community College right now has already updated their web page, but they also have a grant that's allowed them to hire somebody to do all of that. So the other colleges are working through that. All of the colleges have something, but many of them have updated to meet the new policy requirements and procedures. Um, so we're, we're saying that the information needs to be clear, it needs to be outward facing. I don't know if you've ever tried to find anything out about prior learning assessment at any of the colleges, but it's, it's literally hit or miss. You don't know necessarily whether you'll find anything if what you find is, is updated, if there's, if there's enough information to help a student. So what we were after was <coughs> excuse me, making sure that stu students could find the information that they needed. We wanted to um, push it out toward new and currently enrolled students to help students complete faster. And then we're, all, we're doing all of this to keep ourselves in line also with the Student Bill of Rights, which essentially says that students have the right to challenge a course if they feel that they have the requisite information or the requisite learning. The standards for awarding credit are all, it has to be college level learning and skills. And this is important when you're thinking about your adult ed students that it has to be college level learning and skills, that they have to um, admit to the institution, so they have to fill out a form and be admitted to the institution, that um, <clears throat> they have to choose a program of study, even if it's not something that they would go along with, you know, to graduation, which we would prefer, but even if they choose anything, they can't simply transcript, oh, I know all kinds of things about auto mechanics, but I'm going to be a business major. It doesn't work that way. It has to be, um, it has to be appropriate for the program of study. Um, and the credit has to be um, applicable to the, to the program study. They have to meet or exceed a C level, and it's assessed by subject matter experts, which means the faculty have to be <clears throat> the ones who make those decisions. There are a number of methods for awarding that. There's standardized tests. You're aware of those, more, most likely CLEP, AP, IB. Those, um, the AP and IB tend to be for more traditional age students. 
The CLEP test could be taken by anyone, and it's one of those things I'll encourage you to consider for some of your students that they could be CLEP testing at a really low cost, comparatively speaking, and getting themselves some um, general education transferable credit, which would be very, very valuable. Um, institutional challenge exams, most institutions offer challenge exams in some subjects. Most of them, they offer them, it's usually in the sciences or math but some of them will offer in other directions, so that's another way to do that. And that's just, a, it's, a, it's essentially the equivalent of a final exam for a course. Published guides, which I'll show you a little bit more of in a minute here, but that's essentially, we usually use American Council on Education, ACE, um, published guides. They have one set for the military and another for workplace. And what they do is they go out and they assess um, the learning that goes on in these settings, and then they make a decision about how it would translate to college credit, so they call them credit recommendations. And we follow those credit recommendations as a state, so that's another way to do it. Faculty evaluated local industry and workplace, and one of the things that's happening a lot around the state is that faculty who are working in career and technical education programs are connecting with their local businesses, and when they do that, they find out that the people who are currently working at the businesses may have college level or certificate level understanding that can be built upon for a degree, for instance. So what they're doing is they're going into the businesses and assessing what the, what the uh, employees are learning, then they're making decisions about how to crosswalk credit for that learning. So if somebody comes in, they're a, I'm, I'm making this up, if they're a level three at Whitmix, level three might be equal to 12 credits in machining or something like that. So that's how that's set up. And then portfolios, which you're, I know you're all very familiar with the portfolio process. This one's a little bit less painful than the one you have to go through. Um, but the portfolios are more about um, demonstrated learning in terms of, um, often in terms of, um, you'll see them more for things like English classes, art history, that kind of thing. Although we have expanded out into career and technical education by creating a template for an applied sciences portfolio. And then um, we're creating a prior learning assessment credit crosswalk matrix. And what we're doing with that is saying that if somebody has evaluated a course and said that this course is equivalent to a Colorado co a Common Course numbering course, like, you know, this is equivalent to English 121, then we don't think that 50 faculty have to say that that's equivalent. If one faculty member says it's equivalent, we want to document it and we want to put it in the matrix and make sure that the next person who comes in with the same credential doesn't have to be reevaluated. that it's an automatic um, crosswalk. So we're building the tool to do that, partly in Banner and partly in um, a tool that I'll show you in just a little bit. Um, and then, let's see, we'll have in that one, we'll have standardized cut, uh, test scores, CLEP, Dante's DSST, I mean a CLEP, AP, IB, DSST, and UXL are the ones that the community college system support. Um, challenge exams, if they're available by course and institution, that's a, that's a local decision. It's not something they're required to do, but many of them do. And then the published guides, those will all be in the matrix. And then when we post credit, and this is really more kind of an internal thing, um, we, we will make sure that they're admitted with a declared program study, that it's not counted toward FTE, those kinds of things. So that's really more internal. The cost is standardized across the state. No fees charged for posting credit. Um, the student bears a reasonable cost of assessment, and this is one of those ones where it's not um, eligible for financial aid um, yet. You know, there's a lot of conversation going on about why it should be. Some employers will pay for prior learning assessment credit, especially when you talk to them and help them understand that they'll be paying significantly less than they would if they were paying for full credits and time away from the job. Um, but for the most part, the student will have to bear those costs, and again, they're reasonable. Um, non-refundable regardless of assessment outcomes. So if a student um, puts in for an assessment, if they say, I think I could challenge this and, and do it, and if somebody determines that they don't have the skills they need to earn that credit, then they won't be um, getting a refund. It's the, the cost of the assessment. Um, okay. And then um, transfer of credit. Um, PLA credit must be accepted for transfer among all state system colleges. And this is an important piece of information. So all of the community colleges, now keep that in mind, it's not required of the four-year institutions yet, but for all the community colleges, if somebody transcripts prior learning assessment credit at one college, it will automatically transfer to another college and the student does not have to be reassessed. Um, and that's across the boards. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on at the Department of Higher Education about making that true for four-year institutions as well, and that's pretty imminent. That'll be happening in the next six months or so, we should see some things out of the um, Commission on Higher Education that should help us um, be able to learn a lot from that. 
I've got somebody that I need to mute. There we go. Um, okay, so let's keep going. So the matrix is going to have all of those things. Oops, I'm sorry. Standardized tests, the challenge tests by course and inf institution. And what we're doing with that one in the matrix is we're just having information. So the person could look at the matrix and say, well, I know that Red Rocks offers the uh, math 121 test. So if I want to get a 121 test, I could go to, math, to um, Red Rocks for it if I wanted to do that. So that's just to kind of guide the students. Again, that whole idea of being open and transparent with information. Um, we're in, with the standardized tests, we're expanding. We've significantly expanded the tests that we accept, and we um, are lined up with what's going on at um, the Department of Higher Education. So across the state, we'll all be um, accepting the same tests at the same cut scores, which is a big deal. Students don't have to continuously be reassessed wherever they go. Um, the published guide stuff, we're um, requiring schools to document what they do, or we're asking them to, we're not requiring them to, we're asking them to so that we can get it into um, the matrix, we can save them from duplicating, get some transparency out there for students, and then the faculty evaluated stuff we're working on, and that'll be in the matrix. So I'm going to show you this tool because I think it might be useful to you all. It is in a beta, it's not a beta stage, it's a soft launch stage. It's out there, it's real, it's working. You can go on and get on it yourself and play with it if you want to. But I'm telling you that I have not edited the, the, um, the copy yet. So there's a lot of typos in there. There's some odd kind of repetitive things. There's some examples that don't make sense. And it's because the people who designed it for us did all of that and I haven't had a chance to update the text yet. So if you see something, you go, oh, that just doesn't make sense. You say it's because Bitsy hasn't fixed it yet. So um, it's called placredit.com. It's an interactive tool for students and advisors. Um, it's connected to the matrix as the data source, so anything we add to the matrix will automatically be connected to this tool. So if a student puts in a credential um, and we've put something on the matrix, it'll pop for that um, particular credential. It's maintained here at the system. Um, we're going to put a link for this, and we're calling it a tile. There will be a tile on every college page when it's um, put into a hard release, and what we're after is having the college communications folks put it on the front page, on their splash page, but they can put it wherever they want to. So we're going to see how that goes. We're asking for that, but it may be that they'll put it on a prior learning assessment page, or maybe they'll put it on an admissions page, but they, they can make their own decisions about that. What we're really asking for is that it not be difficult for students to find this information anymore. Um, the students can go into this tool. They can create an account. They save. It saves automatically anything they put in it and they can go back to it as much as they want to. They can print it, they can share it with an advisor. Um, there's a lot that they can do with this. It's free to them, doesn't cost the colleges anything. It's just out there in the world. Um, right now, I'm administrating uh, the, um, I'm the administrator for the, the content management system, but we also are going to allow advisors to have an opportunity to um, have connections to the content management system so they can track who's getting in touch with them. So we did a soft launch in December. I'm going to quickly show you this um, if it's going to decide to cooperate with me. Let's see what happens. Okay. So when you do that placredit.com, it shows you this, and it just talks about it being a questionnaire. And again, please don't pay too much attention to the copy. It's got to really be worked on. But you're going to go in here. And so first time a person comes in, they're going to need to sign up. If you've already signed up, there's a login key that you just hit on, but all you have to do, all the student will have to do is put in their name, an email address, um, where they can be reached, and then some kind of a password that they then feel comfortable remembering and using. And that's it. That's the whole sign up. We don't want more than their name and an email address. And then there's a little splash page that talks to them about how the whole thing works. What do you do? You can jump from section to section. That's what this is. So you can go to different sections of the tool. Um, you can, progress is always saved. You can quit any time you want and come back. So when you open it up, what you get, the first thing it has you do is pick a school. And the reason we have them pick a school is because we're going to help them to connect to the school that's nearest to them. If they decide they don't want to go to that school, that's fine. But the purpose of this is to put them with an advisor. That's really what we're after. So they can say, yeah, I want to, you know, I'm going to pick Red Rocks. And, um, and it may be, Stan, your name may already be in here. So if you get an email at the end of all this from me, you should just ignore it. But anyway, um, or from Bitsy Student. 
um, they can always say somewhere else I haven't decided yet. We do ask them to choose a college at the end if they do want to send off their report to an advisor. But so, okay, so I picked Red Rocks. And does it, do I know what my area of interest is? And again, the reason for this is that we need them to have a sense of what they're going to do, where they're going to be, before they try to get awards for PLA credit because it has to be connected to a program of study. So I'm going to say that I'm interested in education. There's no commitment to it. It's just, yeah, that's the way I want to go. So that's what's on my report. Now on this first page, it talks about your credentials. What are your credentials? So there's standardized tests, military training, and work training. The standardized test one, let's just play with this. I'm going to say that I took um, a CLEP test in English. And that's all I'm going to put in there. And you'll notice that right away it pops with college composition, standard test, and CLEP. The minimum score is 50. Potential equivalency for that at the community college system office is English 121. So I'm going to say, oh, yeah, that's the one I took. So let's add that. And then um, do I have another one? Oh, when did I take it? I took it, you know, in June of 2010, and my score was 50. So I'm going to save that. Now, let's see, do I have other ones? I don't have another test. I do have some military training. Now, I'm going to put that in. And the codes that are on what's called my joint services transcript, this is one of those ones, too, that if you're seeing students who are veterans and they have a thing called the joint services transcript, if they don't know what it is or where it is, people at the school can help them with that. They usually do, but if they don't, um, and there's a job code on there a lot of times or there's um, a course code in there. It's, kind of complicated to explain it just like this, but there is, there's a lot of numbers on there that will be useful to us and say, oh, wait a minute, look at that, there it is, that's my basic combat training, that's what I took from that number. So I'm going to add that to my record because that's something I did, and I did it in June, I did a lot in June of 2010, so I'm going to just put that in, okay, so both of those things are on there. What about work training? Did I do anything over here? You know, I worked at McDonald's um, as a supervisor. Um, let me see what I get out of that or if I get anything out of that. What does it say? Oh, look at that, Training Consultants Development Program, McDonald's Corporation. Okay, I'm going to add that. So you'll see that what's happened here is that there's a number of things that we've already put into the matrix that are part of it, and when they put it in there, we have keywords that we follow when it goes in. So I'm going to stop that part there, and I'm going to say, yep, I'm done with this part. I'm going to go ahead and go. And then we have a lot of, um, you know, kind of attaboys, girls going on here. Awesome, awesome job, keep going. Okay, so I'm going to say that's complete. And then it wants to know, oh, did I learn anything else? Well, foreign languages, I can do foreign language because I'm a native Spanish speaker. Um, I'm going to say Spanish. Am I fluent and able to read and write? Well, yes, actually, I am. So let's go ahead with that. Um, and I'm going to say that's complete. I did have some other, oh, wait a minute, there's something else on foreign languages I meant to put in there. Let me see what, I, what the other part was that it told me I could do. It told me I could do something else. What was it? I don't remember. I'm going to take that off. And I'm going to go to foreign language, if it'll let me. Okay. Okay. And then it asks me if I want to add other languages and go forward from there. I'll just keep going. I'm sorry. So what's next? So when I'm finished with all of this, on the foreign languages one, it also, I mean, before the foreign languages one, I skipped a piece there, but it also asks a lot about other types of experience. So at any rate, it comes up, and what I get is what's called the Colorado Prior Learning Report. And on that report, it's, an, it's an, um, a one-page or two-page um, readout of what I've done. I can do a couple of different things. I can print it, or I can email it to an advisor. I can take a look at it. What does it tell me? Um, you know, if I'm not finished with it, I can go back in and finish it. Um, so it shows what tests I have and the potential equivalencies. If it says potential equivalency, it means it's because there's something in the matrix that's already been crosswalked from that. So for instance, for that basic combat training, there's already, um, and this one actually is one of those gobbledygook ones, ACC 101 and ACC 121 are not crosswalks. It was something that was put in by the designers. But when there is an equivalency already in the matrix, it'll pop here. And it says potential equivalency because this is not an official document of any sort. It's meant to help with the advising. It's meant to guide people to say, you know, yeah, you actually could. With the foreign language one, with fluency in Spanish, it could be good for Spanish 111, Spanish 112. Um, it depends. And so we'll have those things pop up. Um, we all, oh, there's the other piece that I didn't have, the non-accredited education. So things like open and online learning. Did you do a MOOC at some point? You know, have you taken a class, one of those free classes online? What was it? What did you, how did you do? Can you prove that you took it? Do you have the, the, the credential? Um, if you've earned any badges, what the issuer of the badge was, and you can attach those here, and then any other kind of non-accredited training. That can be things like 
oh, you know, I was a Girl Scout leader for six years and I was responsible for all the cookie sales, so I had to deal with thousands of dollars in spreadsheets and all kinds of other things that I'm very good at that I don't necessarily have a class or a credential attached to. And then when you click on email to an advisor, um, I thought I did that already. Okay, my school area of interest. I did that already. I'm going to say Red Rocks. I'm going to say education. Okay. And I want to look at my report. Red Rocks and education. Okay, so those are all complete. Okay, and so then I can choose to send it to my advisor. I have to pick a campus for wherever I'm going. I'm going to say I'll pick the Lakewood campus, and I think that actually goes to, oh, no, it goes to Melody. I won't send it out. Then I don't want Melody to get something. She doesn't know what she's getting. And then the next piece is that I send it to my advisor. I click on this, and it send it to my advisor. So that's the, the prior learning assessment tool. And I'm going to um, jump back into the, um, sorry, I'm going to jump back into the, program here, if I can jump back. There we go. Okay. So that was a really quick idea about that. I'm going to start plowing forward through here. So <coughs> some of the things that I think that could be useful for all of you in thinking about it, any of the challenge testing, and I know that, I mean, I know that your students are, um, have a broad range of skills. They have a broad range of needs. Um, a lot of students have skill in one area and don't, you know, need to work on things like, I mean, you know that you have a lot of people who are non-native speakers who have um, professional skills in their native languages or in their homes where there might be some way that they could credential those things. You know, if somebody was a machinist in their native country and they come here and they're really just working on their, their oral skills, can we certify them for the skills that they have otherwise to help them in the job market, that kind of thing. So thinking about that. <clears throat> Challenge testing is one of the big things about that. Could, could somebody challenge, you know, show or demonstrate the skills that the institution would want to see? And then military experience is also a big one that gets overlooked, especially if somebody feels as though they, you know, I was in the military for three years, but I didn't really do a lot of extra training or, you know, I just did the basic stuff and all that. It can still earn them college credit. If somebody did nothing more than basic training and spent their time in um, one particular job that they don't think is, is worth anything, which really probably isn't true, but even basic training will get you some PE credits. You know, there's there's all kinds of opportunities for them to go ahead and, and have credit before they even start. And then the workforce crosswalks, I think, are a big deal as far as the different types of jobs. I showed you that McDonald's has an entire, there's an entire section of McDonald's training that's kind of huge, actually, um, that um, shows a lot of those crosswalks. And I'll go back here in a minute and I'll show you that. But um, Career exploration is an important thing that you could be engaging in, and it doesn't have to be, you know, you all don't have to become, you know, magic career exploration people. One of the things that's out there, again, from this same grant, it's called MFGWorksColorado.com, or um, Career Action Tools, but um, CareerActionTools.com. This one is one that we created on the grant and that guides people into the field of advanced manufacturing. And it's actually a really great um, interactive tool for career exploration. So I would, I would encourage you to, um, to look at that one. Um, and then using PLACredit.com to help them kind of put together their picture in one place would be helpful. And then the workforce centers, especially with the WIOA um, changes, are doing a lot um, for students in terms of making more significant connections for them to um, post-secondary education or further education in ways that I don't think that they used to do from my experience of them. I think that they're much more um, personally involved in a way that they, than they used to be. Um, and I think that they're a good resource for you to connect to if you're not already. So I'm going to say that um, I just flew through here. I want to show you one other thing before I open up for questions. And um, I had it um, up here, the ACE credit guide. There's two different ones. There's the military and then just the national guide, which is um, workforce credit. But I want to give you an idea of the kinds of workforce um, training that they have identified. So let's just do the McDonald's one just for the fun of it. There's two, there's two that I know a lot of the people that I ever worked with worked at was McDonald's and Walmart because that's where we start. I started at McDonald's. So with McDonald's Corporation, there's a huge number of, of things that they have identified. But things like um, for instance, these are all classes from either from McDonald's University or just in general um, 
um, courses that people have to take. So there's a self-study learning management system coach study virtual collaboration for at regional training centers for people to learn about ki kitchen functional um, management, so a manager, a kitchen manager. And what they said about that is that in the lower division baccalaureate, which is what we are, two semester hours in restaurant management. So it could be that if they're interested in, in doing a culinary arts program, for instance, they could then transfer in two credits in restaurant management. If, if there isn't a course that they actually crosswalk to in the co community college system office, they can use these for elective credit, although what we want to do is make sure that we get as many as possible to transfer into um, actual courses. And then, like, so let's say, let's say take a look at the Walmart one, too, because I think that's pretty significant. Um, uh, Walmart has actually done a lot in terms of um, a core training that they're making all of their associates take that actually could um, help people to um, be on track for different types of college credits. So this one is for cashiers. Um, they have to take a six-week course for 40 hours, and they do it in various ways. But they've got it here as one semester hour in credit in uh, customer service. And it may be that if they have two or three of these, we could look at putting them together into something that um, meets the competencies for the, co um, the community college system. So this is the types of thing that I'm saying, that there's all kinds of ways that um, we're working hard to evaluate and to give credit for, um, you know, real learning, significant learning. Um, got myself in the wrong spot again. There we go. Okay. So implementation-wise, we're about midway through here. We're working on, um, we, we uh, have all of our internal functionality in place. We're working on um, getting the word out to the colleges. Um, we're doing some faculty training at the end of this month and the beginning of next month. The dashboard is just about ready to go. We'll be going by the end of February out to the institutions. At that point, then, they're going to be looking at a marketing launch. We've asked the colleges to work with their advising offices to make sure that they're not um, marketing something that the advising offices aren't ready to field. Um, we're going to be working hard on getting institutions to be willing to look at the whole portfolio evaluation process so that more students can get credit if they don't have something that's a traditional credential. And then working on the matrix continuously. So anytime that anything is evaluated, we want to get it into the matrix. Um, and then things that you can do, um, I think that it would be worth your while to check in with your local institutions and find out who you would talk to, which advisors you would talk to um, about prior learning assessment. If you go out on the dashboard tool um, and pick a college, at the end of the report, it'll tell you who the advisor is, but it's, it's a good thing to call and just visit with them about how you think you might be able to connect your students to them. Ask for local information on their procedures. Each college is its own um, community um, outreach. It has its own way of doing things, so check with them and find out what their procedures are like. Um, you can create check sheets for students with contact information for those advisors, steps they should take. A lot of times college can be kind of intimidating when they come through the door. If you give them some, some benchmarks to follow, I think that that helps. And then to help them complete the PLA credit report if, they, if you feel that they're eligible for those things so that they can um, have somebody helping them work through that and don't get overwhelmed by it. We've tried to make it pretty user-friendly, but just to, to help them finish it. And then the other things that you can do is take a look at your own curriculum and the things that you're delivering to see, and you can look at the Common Course Numbering System, which is on the um, CCCS website to see if any of the competencies are matching in terms of college-level work, or to say, I know what college-level work looks like to help your um, students to be more aware. Um, you could practice challenge exams if you feel as though that somebody could be doing that. You can, um, you can take a look at the curriculum and create some practice exams for them. Um, you can talk to the colleges and see if they would give you practice materials or give the student practice materials. I would encourage standardized testing if you have adults who have been in the workforce and come back who might be able to pass some of the standardized tests to earn um, transfer credit. That would be a really smart thing to do. Um, the average or the uh, club tests, I think, cost, um, there's usually a, um, a fee at the college itself for the proctoring, usually $25 to $35, and then the test itself, which I think is $80, $60 or $80. So those two together would give them um, usually as much as the three credit um, three credits in if they pass the test. Um, work with the local colleges on articulation agreements, if that makes sense. If you're doing something that's outside of or that you feel is like a bridging kind of a class where they are getting college level skills, see if there's a way to articulate that to credit. Um, communicate with them regularly. Keep, you know, kind of keep them on your phone list. Make sure that you're on theirs. 
and then really connect with your workforce centers. The work that they're doing on WIOA is really impactful for this kind of stuff. The, the whole point of the work that they're doing is to get people into jobs. And so they're going to be interested in any way to, um, to accelerate, um, um, accelerate credentials. So at this point, I'm going to take questions. And first of all, from Steph, Stephanie Moran, I have um, a question. Are the advisors required to see the official paperwork, i.e., how is the credential verified? What we say to the students in the dashboard is that they should collect those, those um, verifications. So like, for instance, if a student has done CLEP testing, they have to send an official CLEP transcript to the registrar's office. That's been a rule for a long time. Standardized testing is a little bit easier on this. If they are looking to have something like ACE credit crosswalked, then they have to obtain an ACE transcript, which, you know, we have information to show them how to do that. Most of them, many of them already know how to do that. But if not, if we say, you know, you could earn some ACE credit on this, we can, what they then have to do is um, provide their credentials to ACE and they can get a transcript. If they have, like, for instance, if they're, um, they've been through an apprenticeship and they have an apprentice card, they'd be asked to show that. It's not necessarily to the advisor that they'll be showing it. They should have those things in hand when they visit with their advisor, but they're going to have to show them to the registrar in order to get the credit um, approved. And depending on how the institutions want to handle it, it may be that the registrars will say to the advisors, we want you to review these and just give us a sign-off, or the registrars may say, we need to see those. What we're asking um, the registrars to do is to be the ones who um, hold that information. So in terms of putting it into the student record, it would go through the uh, registrars. But no matter what, if they've got something that, that has to be verified, they are responsible for producing that credential. Um, so, um, okay, here's another question. Hold on just a second. Let me see something here real quick. Um, Okay. Okay. So another follow-up question to that. Um, do you know if other border states are also doing PLAC or a similar system? Many Southwest Colorado students head to San Juan College in Farmington, New Mexico. Actually, there's a lot going on in New Mexico. Um, the group is primarily, though, out of, um, I think it's Sotero County, out further east. Maybe, I'm not positive about that, but um, there is quite a lot going on in New Mexico. I guess my, my suggestion would be to get in touch with San Juan and um, ask them what they're doing. It wouldn't be the same, you know, exactly as what we are doing, but I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't open to um, considering it. Um, we've been working quite a bit with, I've been working quite a bit with some people in New Mexico on how they're building their system. So it would be, I think it would be to your advantage to get in touch with them and to see what they might say. Um, here's another from Chelsea. Will there, will there be comprehensive list of courses that are eligible for this type of credit, or is that something that will be determined along the way? Um, the way that this works is that any any course can be challenged. So, if if a student has college level learning in any course, and you look at the Common Course Numbering System description, the curriculum, and you say, um, or the student says, I know all of this. I think I can show this. I can demonstrate this. Then what the institution needs to do is to help to figure out how they would assess that. So is it best assessed by a standardized test? Can we have them do a portfolio? They have the ability to challenge any course in the Common Course Numbering System. What we're keeping track of is the ones that have already been assessed based on a particular credential so that if someone comes in with that same credential, again, it doesn't have to continuously be reassessed. There will be, we'll put some parameters around that, but we're hopeful that um, what we're doing here is saying that if you need if you have a, if there's a course in mind that you feel that you have enough learning from, that it counts toward your program of study, and you would like to challenge that, then you should have the ability at any institution that's part of the state system to be able to challenge that course. And I got a wow from Chelsea. I agree, it's a wow. The big thing about this one is, is that it starts, you know, I think it almost tricks students into being college students in some ways, if you think about it. So they say, like, you know, you have to go to college now, you have 12 credits. What are you going to do with those 12 credits? You've got to earn a degree. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. You'd be surprised. I mean, somebody who, like, for instance, if you have somebody who's working with you who worked in a field where they earned an apprenticeship um, or they earned some kind of a national credential, the chances are quite good that they could enroll in what's called an applied um, uh, technical degree. Is it Associate of Applied Technology? And that's a very broad term for 
you bring us a credential, a national credential, and it's typically apprenticeship credentials. And what you can get is 45 credits toward an associate's degree, and then you have to finish the 15 credits of general ed, general education, and you have an associate's degree. It's an associate of applied technology. That one is our, that exists in the world, in our world. But the thing that I push at is that if you have like, if somebody's been, been doing a job for a particular amount of time and they want to increase their skills or they want to increase their credential, that they ought to be able to get credit for what they already know and then to be starting in a place where they're, they're um, you know, they can increase their learning. Um, do students have to pass the CCPL or can they enroll without it? Um, you know, the, the thing about that is, is that there's a number of different ways to wave out of that, but it has no bearing on whether they can be admitted to the institution or not. What it, what it has a bearing on is whether they go into an English or a math class at a college level or if they have to take a developmental course. So, um, and I think it's a CCPT, but um, if that's, I think that's what you're asking me. Um, so that's one where, you know, they, the, essentially the, what used to be Accuplacer. So if the student, does the student still have to take it? If the student doesn't have the other credentials that would waive them out of it, yes. Um, but if, for instance, a student takes um, a CLEP test and gets English 121, then no, they don't have to take it. They've already completed English 121. Well, one of the things that we're looking at doing is trying to create some badging around um, students demonstrating basic skills so that they don't have to go through the test, but that's a long way off. Here's another one from Christy. If a student scores high enough, and I'm going to ask you guys, when you, send, when you put these out there, um, look on the box and, and make sure that it says send to everyone so everyone can read your questions. So if a student scores high enough on the GED test, GED college ready plus credit, can they get college credit for that? If so, how do they just show their GED test scores? No, the GED test score will not get them college credit. It's not college level. It's um, high school equivalency, not college equivalency. So no. Um, they, um, no, that, I think that's, that's just the answer. But it does make them college ready and it does wave them out of any of the other types of tests they can start at the college level. If you have somebody who takes a test and is that good, I would encourage them to study and take the CLEP, like for instance, if they got out of there in the, in the um, if their strength were, was in the writing or their strength was in the, um, the sciences or whatever, I would strongly encourage them to do a little bit more studying and to try a CLEP test and to see if they couldn't earn some credit that way for significantly less. What else? Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Um, I'm going to unmute. Okay. I don't know. Chelsea said something else about yes or the director meeting. I don't know what that means. So let me unmute Gay here real quick. Actually, Gay isn't muted. Gay, do you want to talk? Do you have anything that you wanted to add? Yoo-hoo. I don't see her. Gay, are you still there? I don't have you muted, so you might have yourself muted. Okay. Um, do any of you, is anyone there that would like to um, add anything or ask more? You're welcome to do that. Any other questions? Oh, there you are, Gay. Um, I don't have you muted. I think you have yourself muted. I was going to see if you wanted to um, see if you wanted to add anything. I'm going to, um, are you there, Gay? You said you're here. You're not talking. Did you mute yourself? Don't you love? Oh, okay. She's not muted, but her systems aren't working. Okay, fine. <laughs> Do you have anything to add or any other questions that you um, would like to put out there? Anybody at all? We have about five more minutes if you want to. If not, we don't have to keep going. We can, we can sign off. Um, I want to encourage you to um, feel free to email me or to call me. Um, Will this be available for review? You mean the, the presentation? Yes, I will send the presentation to Gay as soon as we're off the phone. And then the recording um, has to be um, transposed into the right format, and I'll send her that as well, and she can send it out to you. Um, Sandra has a question. Last week on a GED webinar, we were told that a GED score of 175 would likely be eligible for college credit. Is that something you've heard about? No, it is not. I did hear um, that they did put the um, they did um, change the college-ready 
standard to include the new scores on the GED so that students wouldn't have to be um, testing to go into um, developmental education, but I did not hear about that. What we could do, and I'm uh, way open to listening to it or whatever, if we can find out or if you can um, find resources about um, maybe from College Board about, is it College Board that does that one? Find out what it is that they, um, which skills they are testing that they think are college level and we could, op we could absolutely look at it. If they are indeed testing out of or assessing out of college level work, then we should, if we do it with the technique we've been using, we should be able to figure out if there's a crosswalk. That would be great if we could. But again, I, I think it, it, in the interim, you know, and those kinds of things take a while, in the interim, if a student is that high and they have a particular strength, I would strongly suggest that they do, they do some CLEP testing. Um, it's amazing how much credit people can earn. Um, and keeping in mind that um, the students are allowed to earn up to 75% of the credits in any degree or certificate um, through methods other than being in the classroom. They can earn them through PLA. They have to do 25% of their degree in residence, um, but the rest of it they can earn in other ways. So there's not going to be a, as long as it applies to a program of study, there's not going to be a big limit on what they can earn this way. Um, and Gay says for everyone who's attended, um, email her back to get, uh, let her know if you're interested in more training in these areas, horn underscore g at cde.state.colco.us. I think you can all probably see that. Any other questions? And like I said, I'll send this recording to um, Gay and I will send the um, proposal. I know the proposal, the presentation. It's the afternoon, my brain's not working anymore. I'll send the presentation. And um, if you have anything come up, any questions, concerns, if you have any ideas about this, I'm way open to them. I, I would love to see us create some strong connections from adult ed to the colleges where we can really help students to not have to continuously prove themselves or to continuously repeat things, because that's just an incredible disincentive to higher education. So if, if anything like that comes up that you um, have ideas about, please feel free to call me or shoot me an email. And with that, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to say that I will go ahead and sign off. Thank you all very much for participating. Um, I wish that I was in a room with you so that we could visit and I could see your faces, but maybe we'll do that again sometime. So hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you very much.